Hi, this is lesson two in the series on injustice and justice and working toward uh, a uh, working definition, moving moving toward a, a, a working definition. So this is what we are trying to do is identify exactly how to have a conversation that is efficient and effective in communicating uh, what we mean when, uh, as individual chaplains, we uh, t- think about and how we how we define what justice is. And so, first, we have to understand what the just what the concept of justice is in this earthly plane, so that we can recognize whether it is eternal or earthly justice. And then we need a working definition. Uh, from the kingdom of God, from the citizenship uh, that we uh, enjoy as a result of entering into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And of course, we know that Jesus Christ has has two identities and they are reflected in his name. Um, he is the Messiah, Emmanuel, God, God in the flesh, um, I mean, he is fully God. He is the Savior, the uh, promised Messiah of Israel. And then he is also a, a fully a human being. And he speaks a lot out of that uh, identity. Uh, this is not our subject now. This is number two in the series on injustice and justice toward a working definition. So I, uh, I, I, start, I worked on, um, in the last session we, we discussed, or I presented these, uh, the basic idea of how subcultures and cultures I, uh, define a sense of justice and injustice within themselves that may or may not, and generally are not, is not, uh, in agreement with the rest of the culture. And, they, and then they... Those sub, the individuals in that subgroup, after they have united together in a, in a common cause of, of overcoming the injustice in their lives that is being imposed upon them by the society, they work very hard to try and get that information over to the rest of the society. So as a result of this condition, where they are trying to impose their viewpoints on the society to decrease the uh, feeling of injustice within themselves, uh, there is a result. And as a result, there, is, there exists in all cultures this constant conflict between subcultures that have offending perceptions of permissible behaviors. Okay, so we have a bunch of subcultures, and I've defined that as small units of individuals who are in agreement about how to live their lives, what is right and wrong, and they unite together and form a group, a social group of some kind, and then within that subculture, certain things are considered to be acceptable, certain things are considered to be unacceptable, and they have their own set of rules and regulations the governing uh, what they are going to do as they navigate their life and get through life safely on this earth. And we know we've been talking recently about the blue culture in our, in our, uh, in our nation because there's a subgroup within the police force that, that behaves in a certain way that they seem to be giving themselves permission to be judge and jury and uh, con- uh, condemning uh, of the people that uh, that they are only supposed to arrest and bring into trial, but they are taking their this action into their own hands. Now, within that subculture, they have decided that's the only safe way to be a policeman is to some of them, not all of them, is to protect themselves in all circumstances first, so that they survive and and they go home to their families at night. And they have come to a position of belief that certain behaviors, certain people, certain activities, certain events are threatening to that. And it would be unfair to them uh, in their minds to say that they can't protect themselves and go home to their families after their shift um, 
and do whatever is necessary to be able to survive that position when they have to go after people that are violent, willing to kill them, and, uh, and not be uh, taken into custody for whatever reason. However, there is, uh, uh, in the larger uh, national perception, a recognition that taking this much force and this in initial action of violence in, in, in protecting yourself in the possibility that there might be a danger is gone to the point where innocent people are being killed. And, and, and uh, obviously, within our culture, there is a subculture here, the, the, innate, the well, all of the uh, uh, people of color who have immigrated or been enslaved or brought here uh, in the past and wind up being citizens of the United States equal, co-equal with everybody else in the United States, they feel and they are justified in saying that our people are being targeted by the police force. And so they definitely, and I agree, they, they consider the police's action in isolated cases to be unjust. And it puts them in a position where they are afraid all the time. And they don't want to be afraid all the time. They want to have the same freedom everybody else has. Uh, that's one of the variables in the whole concept of subgroups and uh, perception of injustice. Uh, what, what we don't realize is, is that pretty much everybody in a culture, that is, when the culture is fear-based, everybody lives in fear, unless they're living as a citizen in another, uh, in a country where, um, or a civilization or a culture, that uh, does not have fear. Those, those, that culture doesn't exist on earth. We're not going to find it. All of our cultures and all of our nations are, and all of our subjects, uh, subgroups are fear-based. And so the concept of uh, eliminating fear seems ludicrous. However, within the kingdom of God, as a citizen in God's kingdom, we enter a culture where we are told not to be afraid of anything but to trust that God has control of everything and that he is guiding us and directing us and we are to live by faith. Uh, making that uh, workable in a, uh, in a fear-based uh, is extremely difficult, if not impossible. At least it's impossible within the resources of the physics of this world. And since we are citizens of the kingdom of God, which exists in another realm, and we have a provisional resource in, in God that he has placed in our world, we can access that uh, information from him when we align ourselves with his teachings and follow what he says to do in order to be in that alignment. Then we will hear his voice and he will guide us and give us information and we will be able to navigate our, our life in a way that demonstrates fairness and justice and we will be able to fulfill his uh, his mandate we are called to um to loose the chains of an injustice in isaiah 58 now that's the basis of this conversation how do we identify justice what is injustice how do we release those chains how do we place a person in a condition of eternal justice and how do we navigate our lives and how do we free people from these bondages that are placed on them by the society they live in on this earth? And that's part of our job as a chaplain when God sends someone to us. And we've discussed that already. So I'm, I'm uh, concerned that you understand what I'm saying when I say that there are offending perceptions of permissible behaviors. The uh, L B G T Q uh, individuals, the culture within our nation is being uh, treated unfairly and restricted from some behaviors that everybody else in the nation gets to have. 
One of them, of course, recently in the last five years, is 10 years, a very heated discussion about uh, the fact that that people in that community, in that subculture, were not allowed by our by the larger culture, by the United States, to get married and have their ma marriage be recognized because the law has said that a marriage is between a man and a woman. And they took exception to that. They said, um, I should be able to marry anybody I want to marry if that's uh, my decision. I want freedom to do that. And it was unjust from their standpoint as they viewed that as unacceptable, uh, a law that made no sense, is inconsistent and separates them out of society, takes advantages away from them that other people can get by being married. And uh, that's their position. Um, uh, on the other hand, the, the culture, uh, many cultures in America, uh, especially the Christian culture, has viewed um, uh, marriage as as between a man and a woman only. And that's why we have the law that you can't be married unless you're married to the opposite sex. Oh, man, and that, that, uh, that sense of injustice that they felt is, is uh, powerfully impacting our culture. And they are doing whatever is necessary to get that freedom. And indeed, in most states now, if not all states, I haven't kept up with it lately, it is permissible for uh, people to become married and have the same marital status as a man and a woman when it is a same-sex marriage or not the traditional Christian ethic of a man and a woman getting married. Only, only a man and a woman. And they're really, you see, you come to this permissible behavior concept, this idea that it's not permissible, it's not a correct or right to allow or just to allow uh, two people of the same sex to get married and have the same benefits as a traditional couple who have... Uh, uh, who have the same, the male and the female sexes in the relationship. You see, this is an, a prime example of the earthly dilemma that we get in because of injustice and the feeling of injustice. So these people felt it was unjust. From an earthly standpoint, it is unjust. From an eternal standpoint, uh, we would have to look at that and ask and seek God and study his word to determine what is just in the, in the eyes of God. And I think um, from my studies, I would, I would agree that God made a man and a woman for the purpose of procreation. And the reason that they get married is because they're going to have children as a product of that union. And they have to be there to take care and raise those children in the way that they should go. So the society will have a firm foundation in the family, uh, in the production of children. And the, the balanced child who's raised by the birth uh, parents' uh, product is much more efficiently uh, accomplished and much more successfully done when the, the original birthing parents are with uh, that child throughout childhood into adulthood so that he, has, that child has, he or she has a launching pad from which to emerge. Now that's a whole other subject that I have lots of thoughts on that goes beyond the scope of this discussion. So anyhow, I just want you to have a clarity of mind um, when I mean offending perceptions of permissible behaviors. That's a very key point in this discussion. You will have offending, you will be offended by behaviors of, of some cultures as a chaplain that are ingrained in your thinking of what is right and what is wrong, what is fair, and what is unjust and what is just. And they may be earthly uh, perceptions that are not eternal, uh, following the eternal guidelines of just justice and injustice. But you may think they are, but they may not be. This is what the chaplain has to be able to do, have, have uh, the freedom to have room in their minds, like Jesus has said in John, he said uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, the leaders of, Jew 
of Israel who were um, who were trying to discredit him and 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 get a reason to crucify him. They, he said to them, "You have no room in your mind for my words." Now, in order to have room in your mind for God's words, you cannot show any partiality. You you must consider all people equally important, and you must recognize that you have not got the answers, and some of the, many of the things that you think personally are incorrect, and you need to seek God for an answer, and not think that you understand everything and that you don't need to learn. We want to be in that condition our entire lives, and that part of that can, part of the definition of humility, which I have in another place. It is uh, is uh, is applicable here that we are to live in a humble condition where we are not arrogantly believing that we have the answer and we have the right uh, subgroup and everybody else is wrong. And most denominations are like that. And that is unjust in the kingdom of God. God does not want more than one do- denomination. He doesn't want us separating out into little groups and hating the other ones and saying anybody who goes to that church, they don't got the truth and they're bad, they're evil. And that happens a lot. But I don't, that's another subject I won't get into. So I'll get back to the subject at hand. Um, <clears throat> so one group thinks it is acceptable to behave in a way that offends another group's sense of justice. This reflects a philosophical observation that uh, that a man by the name of Hegel made in Germany um, about a hundred years ago or more. Uh, I don't remember the exact date that he presented this, but it is uh, a philosophy of life that has integrated itself into our world because it's it's just defining what he was observing in in the way that individuals interact and how they solve problems in general. And he came up with uh, a theory uh, of why that is. It's called the Hegelian. It's called the Hegelian. There's another word for it, but it's by Hegel. So it's, it's, anyhow, I'm just going to tell you what it is. Um, It's a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. Now he was observing the interaction between human beings. And he noticed that every time somebody came, maybe he had this with his wife. I don't know. I certainly did for 43 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he noticed that when, when a person, a male or a female, would uh, come up with an idea and state that idea as something they think is right or, or, or correct, and when, it, when it wasn't proven by factual information at the time that could not be refuted, the opposite person the person hearing the, the postulation or the theoretical construct that was being presented, the idea, the guess about the cause between things, uh, they would present a thesis, which is um, a theory. And, and, then, and then the person listening will say the, the direct opposite is true to what that person has said. And that is the antithesis. Now, that causes a situation of uh, conflict that can be positive or negative. If the two people uh, recognize one another's viewpoints from coming from different subgroups or different perceptions of what is right and wrong, different perceptions of justice and injustice, and they begin to dialogue about that and they listen to one another and they hear the other person's perspective and why they think they're being treated unjustly and why why uh, the other person's behavior is offending them. Um, those two circumstances, uh, those, that discussion has uh, theoretically the potential of bringing together the best of both theories. We, we need to recognize that in every one of these theoretical circumstances where we're stating what we think is true about something that is not factual, but is uh, trying to understand something that's occurring, and we have an idea about why it's occurring, but there's no factual evidence to support that idea. That's a theory. And that theory is incorrect in some ways, and it's correct in other ways. And so the two coming together and 
bashing heads, so to speak, or throwing ideas out and discussing that uh, concept, they will be uh, fighting with it. That's the Hegelian synthesis uh, that we're seeking, that he says it's potential that when they do that, if they're listening to each other and being respectful to one another and hearing how the other was in feeling, they will stop banging heads eventually, and there will be a meshing of ideas. So the, the, the uh, unjust elements of one side of the conversation will be rejected. And the unjust elements of the other side of the conversation will also be rejected. So the two will be able to then live in harmony because both of them have a sense that the other party understands their sensitivities and their beliefs about this issue and have heard them and have shown an interest in having compassion on their sense of injustice. And I think that's one of the major things that God is asking us to have in his kingdom. This compassion on other people, understanding the journey that we're in, the human condition, and the lack of understanding and power we have over everything, that uh, in the kingdom of God, we show no partiality as God shows no partiality, and God understands how we've gotten into the kind of situation that we are. And so he wants us free from distress over the injustice we perceive as temporary beings on this earth. And he's provided a way to escape that sense of injustice in a very ingenious way that most of us will not engage in. And it's free for us if we want to take it and grasp a hold of it. We won't feel... Uh, the sense of injustice that we have ever felt again when we enter into that condition. We'll discuss that later. So I have some more to say about this. So one group thinks something's acceptable and the other group does not. And this is uh, the th that reflects what Hegel saw, the, the antithesis and the thesis and the synthesis concept. So synthesis, when that happens, the model... Uh, attempts to recognize a common inherent process natural to social structure that causes progress. So when there is this, this discarding of the unjust behavior then in what in, that is being imposed on another subgroup by a, a more powerful group perhaps, or they're just battling with each other in a conflict, and when the two mesh together and stop overlaying one another, and embrace one another's sensibilities. There's a meeting of the minds, and there can be progress toward uh, a definition for justice for the first time, uh, progress toward a meeting, uh, something that meets the needs of all people in, in the subculture. The model identifies the fact that when a person puts forth an idea, another in inevitably presents an opposing idea. And this is the, the basis of all conflict in our world today. In the model, the two positions will interact in a positive way to bring about a synthesis. Uh, the synthesis in a, is an agreed upon meeting in the middle in such a way that both positions emerge in harmony. The dynamic exists in all processes on earth in such a way that progress and development move into a more efficient position. In the event that the individual group, the culture, or the individual group cultures, I mean, believe that all the other groups are incorrect, and, they, that, and that one subculture demands that all groups adopt the, the, the group, the, their own groups, their, their ideologies, their belief systems, and uh, their behaviors as acceptable, and they refuse to recognize the freedom of other subgroups to in, engage in defining what is and is not acceptable based on their sensibilities. Um, uh, this demand upon the other groups by one group and the refusal to engage in mesh, meshing of productive ideas, there can be no synthesis and it, it can't emerge out of the discussion because there's no discussion. 
It needs to be a peaceful, calm discussion. I think that's probably what the what the peacemakers are advocating and what the uh, people, you know, go over and trying to create a peace accord. You know, uh, the, the uh, political people that are called to do that bring about a meshing of understanding of one another's cultures within, for instance, the Middle East. Uh, there are many people working for, to bring peace between nations there. And that, and that happens, it works for a little while when we have a really good peacemaker. And then, it, and then it falls back into the human condition of hostilities because other people are behaving in a way that, that some groups don't like and refuse to give permission for those people to do those things under any circumstances. So they think it's damaging to society. Some people, some subgroups believe the behavior of other, other groups are Okay, are, are, is evil and damaging to society. And indeed, some of them are, and some of them are not. But in order to determine which are and which are not, we have to have an eternal uh, working definition of what injustice is so that we don't personally begin to impose unjust rules and regulations on other people because of our sensibilities and what we perceive to be true and not be considerate and compassionate on the condition of the others in such a way that we are able to uh, listen and hear, walk alongside, get in their shoes, and, and really see what, what they're saying. Because I believe ultimately when we do that, we will have a depth of understanding and compassion that comes from God and makes it uh, possible for healing and progress toward a peaceful world to occur. In this condition that we're in right now, there's no progress toward a peaceful war world. Quite the contrary, we're moving closer and closer to more and more uh, violence, more and more conflict, to the point of uh, people killing one another, which is right now occurring in the United States. And, and I'm very ashamed of that. Yeah, and I would like to be part, and part of the reason I'm doing this right now is to be part of the solution. However, I discovered that that the people that want to maintain their unjust position refuse to listen to what I say, <laughs> which is, you know, to be expected because it would mean they'd have to give something up. They'd have to compromise at some level and they don't want to compromise on anything. In fact, that's one of the ethics in some of the churches I've been to where we are not allowed to compromise our beliefs about Jesus Christ as if we have everything perfect and all the other groups in the world are uh, wrong and going to hell. And that's not true. That's, that's unjust thinking. And we never want to think that way as Christians because it's certainly not part of the kingdom of God. He never told us to hate other people, to condemn other people, and to discard them as hopelessly worthless because they won't believe the way we do. No, he never said that. Many churches say he did, but he didn't. And you can't find it in Scripture, my friend. And if you do find it, let me know, because I'll instruct you more perfectly in how to interpret that part of the Scripture. Many Scriptures have been misinterpreted to, in such a way that it's created injustice, ridiculous injustices throughout history, perpetrated by those who profess to follow Jesus Christ. As, as peacemakers, we will not be engaging in activities that create wars or kill people <laughs> and 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 god will will provide us a way of escape from that in his wisdom now if we have a tyrant of course we have wars where we had tyrants that had to be deposed and uh, with a, the right conversation we might have been able to deal with it but uh, it came to a point where the world could not allow a, a dictator, I'm speaking of Hitler, uh, to do what he was doing, and we had to stop him, and in order to stop him, there had to be a war in, in order to stop him. Now, that really wasn't required, however, because of the sensibilities and the injustice of the Nazis, the world had to say, we can't tolerate this occurring, we got to do whatever we have to do to stop it. And it went to the point of killing people. Many people died. That occurred in the Civil War also because some people felt it was unfair and unjust to enslave other human beings. 
and uh, equally co-equal with every other human being. Every human being is the same. Just because you have a different, uh, less than a, uh, the smallest, very small distance in the skin, the pigmentation of the skin is tiny. After you get past the pigmentation of your skin, everything's exactly the same. Our brains are the same, our wants, our needs, our desires, our feelings, our emotions, our need for justice, all are the same. And so there is no difference between one human being and another in the, in the concept. In any evolutionary or any natural selection, we're all equally in the same place and we are not to show anyone that we think they are different than we are. And even even acknowledging the difference is racist. When we meet a person with a different colored skin, we should have no, even the slightest bit of thought that there's a difference between us, because there isn't. <laughs> and that's what God has taught us, and that's part of the kingdom of God. It is unjust for us to encounter another individual and treat them differently because of the color of their skin. <coughs> Just acknowledging that they have a different color is unjust and is racist. I know some people may take exception at that, but that's absolutely true in the kingdom of God. He does not care about what color your skin is. He does not care about what culture you come from. He, he does not decrease his love for you because you're one, one person in a different culture or from different parents or any condition you're in. He accepts you the way you are. And that's part of his justice. That's justice in the kingdom of God. No, no partiality to any human being for any reason, any characteristic, intelligence, wealth, poverty, any element that you might say disabilities that are not disabilities unless you think they are. Uh, limitations, fear uh, is not to be enga engaged in in the kingdom of God. Fear creates injustice. And so God says, we are not to fear. He said, perfect love casts out fear. And I'll be going into that later when I get into what the kingdom of God it says of, and, and establishes as a working definition for justice in the kingdom of God. So, uh, it may seem ludicrous uh, to you or impossible uh, and certainly, I think it is humanly impossible to gather all subgroups together for a meeting of the, of the collective mind and lead into an agreed-upon definition. This is absolutely true. We are not capable in, of, of ourselves to enter into an, uh, the, uh, the complexities the, that are going to emerge when we try to find a working definition for what justice is and what injustice is in an earthly culture, in, in, on this earth, the entire earth, and bringing everybody together in harmony and peace where everybody's sensibilities are considered, are understood, and that which is unjust is discarded 